This week on Jerusalem Dateline, a look at the war words between Iran and the U.S. As of today, we are officially putting Iran on notice. And see how Israel is taking the lead in cyber warfare. Israel is uh, at the cutting edge of uh, cyber defense. Plus, the heartwarming story of how one Jewish philanthropist is standing with Christian doctors in the heart of Africa. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Just days after Donald Trump's inauguration, Iran launched a ballistic missile test, violating a UN resolution. A quick White House response showed Iran and the world, it's not business as usual in Washington. A ballistic missile launch in late January may have been Iran's way of testing the reaction time of the new Trump administration. It didn't take long to find out. President Trump has severely criticized the various agreements reached between Iran and the Obama administration as well as the United Nations as being weak and ineffective. Instead of being thankful to the United States in these agreements, Iran is now feeling emboldened. As of today, we are officially putting Iran on notice. Putting Iran on notice, I think, is, is making good use of the bully pulpit and not letting Iran get off the hook. After the ballistic missile test, Fox News reported Iran launched a short-range missile. But just days ago, Iran removed another ballistic missile from its launch pad. It remains to be seen if that was a direct response to the Trump administration saying that Iran is on notice or if there was a technical issue or a technical failure that made them remove the missile. But I think Iran should be cautious. Many Middle East analysts believe appeasement isn't the way to deal with Iran. Strength works, and I think the Iranian regime would be the first ones to tell you that. Let's remember that when Ronald Reagan uh, became president, uh, the Iranians released the, all the American hostages uh, for fear that under Ronald Reagan, the United States would take military action. This new attitude represents a major departure from how President Obama dealt with the mullahs in Tehran. It also puts Israel and the U.S. on the same page. For the first time in, in the past eight years, Israel and its greatest ally and friend, the United States, see the Middle East in very similar ways. Uh, the number one threat to regional Middle Eastern stability and security is the Islamic Republic of Iran and their nuclear-backed surge for regional dominance. The Iranian threat may seem remote to people in Europe and the United States, but it's a different story here. An Iranian official boasted that one of their ballistic missiles could reach Israel in seven minutes. Dan Diker edited this journal 10 years ago, warning of the Iranian threat. It is like an octopus spreading its, uh, its, uh, spreading its tentacles um, and destabilizing almost every country in the Middle East uh, except Israel. And the end goal is to eventually threaten the United States. It targets U.S. allies in the region, it targets U.S. partners in the region, and it seeks to un unravel U.S. national security goals in the region. It wants to change the balance of power that the U.S. has helped array against Tehran and the Persian Gulf. The major question facing the Trump administration is how to address the nuclear deal with Iran. On the campaign trail, Trump said he would repeal or renegotiate the agreement. But it remains to be seen what direction he will take as president. It's an item sure to be on the agenda when Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu meet next week in Washington. Joining me to talk more about this is our CBN Middle East correspondent, Julie Stahl. Uh, Julie, what do you expect they're going to be talking about? Well, as you said, Chris, Iran is surely to top the agenda. We should note that the prime minister's office hasn't issued any kind of statement about what they're going to talk mm -hmm. about. But we can imagine what they're going to talk about. Iran, mm -hmm. uh, the other day, prime minister said he would talk about cybersecurity with the president. And the president mm -hmm. has said he's also making that uh, a top on his agenda. We're going to hear more about that right. in a little bit. Settlements, I assume, going to be. Settlements. That'll be yeah. a big issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, last week, we talked about that last week, right. that the White House had issued a statement and the media made a big deal about the fact that the White House said they're not probably not helpful right. towards achieving this new settlement that Netanyahu right, announced. Right, right, not mm -hmm. helpful towards achieving peace. But the difference was they said it's not an impediment to peace, which is a total shift from decades of White House um, policy. Yeah. 
So, so if this was a Clinton administration, Hillary Clinton was there, we would have heard a big uproar from the State Department, from the White House. Oh, for sure. And yeah. s settlements are a stumbling block to peace, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And now here you have the White House saying they're not an impediment mm -hmm. to peace. Wow. That's a, that's a whole big shift. Yeah. So they will for sure talk about that. Mm -hmm. What are the Palestinians saying? So the Palestinians, um, first of all, I talked with a uh, Palestinian expert, Pincus Mbari, and um, he said, first of all, the Palestinians don't like Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, they're, they, they thought Hillary was going to win, and they already had a plan with the Europeans to rev up mm -hmm. the violence, rev up another intifada. So now they're kind of stuck. So, um, but so this what is what I <laughs> right. So we asked Pincus about mm -hmm. what, he, what the Palestinians think about this meeting with Donald Trump. And here's what he had to say. First of all, to the relief, uh, the meeting between Trump and, Trump and Netanyahu will not focus on the Palestinian problem, unlike Kerry and uh, Obama. Mm -hmm. The meeting will focus on Iran, mm -hmm. on Iran. So the Palestinian issue will not be prime in the priority. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, they are very much aware that the, that the Trump administration is not set hostile to settlements. Mm -hmm. Now, settlements is the core issue of their diplomatic campaign. It's very important for the Europeans. It's not important at all to the Americans. So here, they are very much afraid that uh, Israel will have a green light uh, from America uh, to spread settlements. Uh, but, uh, but I think that uh, this will not happen because also Israel is not very much interested uh, to, uh, to open a, a front uh, with Europe. And it, I, if it's so important for Europe about the settlement, so Israel will free the set not free the settlements. Israel uh, will uh, focus on building a in settlements block and inside uh, the fences of the existing uh, settlements and will not expand. Well, Julie, it makes sense that they would be going to Europe because I don't think they're going to find the kind of uh, ear that they had with the Obama administration. I don't think they may feel a friendly uh, <coughs> voice there in the, in the White House. But what's the takeaway for uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu? Well, this is probably going to kind of like the meeting of his dreams. You know, all the time that President Obama, former President Obama was in the White House, they, they kept saying, well, they don't have good chemistry. Well, Netanyahu and Trump have mm -hmm. great chemistry. They're on the same page. And even, you know, they're friends. So for Netanyahu, this is going to be a, a trip to the White House, but also a trip to see a friend. So there's bound to be some uh, good statements come yeah. out of it mm -hmm. and, and a good rapport developing between them. Well, Julie, we're going to see, obviously, a whole new relationship between Trump and Netanyahu that we saw in the last eight years with Netanyahu and Obama. It's going to be a, a, it's a new era. New era indeed. Thank you. Up next, could Israel play a part in upgrading American cybersecurity? Welcome back. As we just heard, cybersecurity will be part of Netanyahu's talks with President Trump. Trump plans to upgrade cybersecurity in America, and Israel could play a central part in that plan. Here's Julie Stahl with more on that story. Israel is one of the most advanced countries in the world in cybersecurity. Israel is uh, at the cutting edge right. of uh, cyber defense, and um, we can use all the help mm -hmm. we can get. Dr. Eviatar Matanya, head of the Israeli National Cyber Directorate, said there are several reasons. One is our need and notion of security. And cybersecurity is a part of security in general. The second one is our high-tech uh, industry. And the third one is our security forces. Matanya spoke to CBN News in Tel Aviv during one of the world's largest cyber trade conferences Cybertech 2017. Matanya says a major challenge is that cyberspace doesn't have borders. We talk about, for example, the electricity grid of nations. We talk about uh, transportation, airplanes, vehicles. We talk about the banks, the financial sector, or healthcare systems. Whenever you use computerized systems, it is also vulnerable to the bad guys. President Trump's advisor on cybersecurity, Rudy Giuliani, told CBN News 
We're not in a cyber war yet. Uh, I don't think it's a it's a fully declared war or or mm -hmm. a complete, complete ongoing war, but we have a we have a lot of cyber attacks mm -hmm. for different reasons. And of course, we have a great concern in the United States with uh, cyber attacks from terrorists, right. not just from nations. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu plans to discuss cybersecurity when he meets President Trump. The Internet of Things can be hijacked by nefarious actors for dangerous purposes with dangerous results. Again, what you see today is going to get a lot worse in the future if we don't band together. Cyber consultant Chaim Tomer is a former head of intelligence in the Israeli Mossad. Tomer told CBN News international cooperation must improve. We are all getting into the psyche that we need to protect ourselves. It will fall the 9-11. We still need this kind of uh, wake-up call uh, to understand that we need to do much more in order to protect the Western uh, civilization. That includes the IOT, the Internet of Things, which ranges from smart appliances like refrigerators linked to supermarkets to telemedicine and beyond. The biggest challenge of the humankind will be the IOT. Erez Kreiner, former director of Israel's Cyber Security Authority, gave a chilling scenario of the dark side of this technology. Now think that you're driving your car and suddenly from your media system you hear, all right, this is John, the terrible uh, guy, I hacked your uh, car and if you don't transfer now that kind of money to my account, just look what I can do. And then he accelerate the car and then he stops the car. For now, the mission is to find out how to stop the bad guys before they can disrupt life in the West and the rest of the world. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Tel Aviv. Up next, see how an American Jewish businessman is helping Christian missionary doctors save lives in Africa's poorest nation. Welcome back to Jerusalem Dateline. For our next story, CBN News traveled 7,000 miles to the tiny African nation of Burundi. It's poor, hungry, and recently declared the world's unhappiest country. But now there's hope, as a wealthy Jewish philanthropist and Christian doctors work to help some of that nation's most vulnerable. George Thomas shows us their inspiring efforts. It's easy to miss on a map. Roughly the size of Maryland, Burundi is one of Africa's smallest countries. It used to be the third poorest in the world. Now it's number one. The average person here lives on less than a dollar a day. In 2013, American Jason Fader moved his wife, Heather, and their two kids to Burundi to serve as a missionary doctor in this remote valley. Kibuye Hospital is about three hours outside the capital city. Uh, between here and there, there is no surgeon. The, the majority, all except for me, of the surgeons in Burundi work in the capital city. And for a population of 10 million people, there are only 13 surgeons, with Fader becoming number 14. And on a typical day, how many surgeries uh, are you doing? Uh, I schedule one or two, and we end up doing 10. Like many other missionaries here, he raises his own support. It would be difficult to find a place in the U.S. where I could have even a, a smidgen of the impact that one surgeon can have here in the middle of Africa. There's two million people out there that, are, that have no surgeon, and I'm happy to be here to help care for them. Half of Burundi has no access to portable water. Some 70% of the nation lives below the poverty line. There's no health care to speak of. So as you can imagine, this small Christian hospital here in a remote corner of Burundi acts as a lifeline to tens of thousands of people. Rachel and Eric McLaughlin, Alyssa Feaster, and John and Jessica Cropsey joined the faders in Burundi as missionary doctors. Officer, 10 fois par jour, pas de problème. 
John Cropsey is one of only three ophthalmologists here. The work we do is stressful. Um, got cross-cultural conflict going on. You've got stressful work, limited resources. During dry season, we can have a, as little as two hours or even sometimes no power uh, during the day. Lord God, I thank you for this chance to be here today. I pray that you would be with this woman and her baby. I pray for a safe delivery. In your name we pray, amen. Rachel McLaughlin is one of just 20 OBGYNs. Faith in Christ and the opportunity to help the less fortunate are just some of the reasons that compel these doctors to serve in less than ideal conditions. God has called us to this place. So he's called us to hard work, but he's called us to good work. And I think that we can see his redeeming story um, when we have the eyes to look for it. In addition to meeting physical and spiritual needs, Fader's team also trains a new generation to serve here. We thought the opportunity was really great to come to Burundi to disciple and train medical students and hopefully residents in the future in order to be physicians who can care compassionately for, for their people in Jesus' name and provide excellent health care. So here's an interesting angle to the story. Thousands of miles from the hospital all the way in downtown New York City, Mark Gerson, a Jewish businessman, has decided to personally get involved in helping these Christian medical missionaries change the destinies of some of Africa's poorest. The Torah, the Bible, tells us 36 times, more than it tells us anything else, to love the stranger. And who in the world is more of the stranger than the African poor in need of medical care? For several years, Gerson and his wife have given millions of dollars to support missionary doctors across Africa. It's been an honor and a privilege for my wife, who's a rabbi, and I, to partner with these, and I choose this term carefully, these sacred people these Christian medical missionaries who are sacrificing everything, go into environments that are completely forbidding, give up everything that we in the West consider necessities a lot of the time in order to fulfill their religious obligation to serve the poor. Gerson and longtime friend Dr. John Fielder, an American medical missionary serving in Kenya, co-founded African Mission Healthcare Foundation. Fielder says through his friendship, Gerson has seen firsthand the dedication of these missionary doctors. Medical missionaries tend to, to come for years or decades and, and stay and learn the language and learn the culture and develop deep relationships in their communities. Last month, Gerson presented the first ever Laheim Prize for Outstanding Christian Medical Missionary Service to Dr. Jason Fader and his team. So when I first saw that this prize was from a Jewish entrepreneur, I certainly did a double take. But Fader knew there was more to Gerson than just his generosity. He sees the care for the poor, the care for the stranger as part of his faith tradition, and I have a lot of respect for that. Fielder says a prize of this magnitude to one African hospital is far-reaching. The Laheim Prize uh, will provide a half a million dollars to Kibuye Hope Hospital in Burundi, which will help it to complete a new surgical building, start an internship, uh, the first in the country for medical school graduates, to renovate a laboratory, and to help about 350 people walk again with orthopedic supplies. Gerson insists there's no one better who delivers a higher return on investment than medical missionaries serving in Africa. As an example, he points to what Dr. Fader and his team did at the hospital in 2015. He enabled 35,000 inpatient, now patient, patient visits. He enabled 1,200 surgeries, and he enabled 800 cataract operations, all for half a million dollars. Fader says Gerson's generous gift will continue to touch and heal the lives of countless people across this nation. It's amazing how much you can do with so little. You know, we're not doing laparoscopic esophagectomies, but we are helping people walk. We are saving lives at the rate of sometimes thousands per year. George Thomas, CBN News, Burundi. Coming up. See how Christians helped Israelis during recent arson and wildfires that swept through Israel. Welcome back. 
Hundreds of homes were lost in huge wildfires that swept Israel late last year. CBN's Operation Blessing was on hand to help during that time of crisis. And here's a story of one family they helped. When strong winds and extremely dry conditions caused a wildfire to spread across Haifa, Israel, Nilly Karen didn't know if she and her four children would survive. With clothes on our uh, face, for two hours we ran outside the neighborhood. Every neighborhood was in fire. More than 70,000 people were forced to evacuate Haifa. Nearly 500 homes were damaged or completely destroyed. Next morning I came uh, here and I saw everything. I died started to cry. The whole living room, the whole patio was burnt. Air conditioning where it was melted, the furniture melted. The whole room, everything was black. I cannot re even tell you how it was so sad. Just a few hours after the fire was put out, Operation Blessing Israel was on the ground in Haifa with blankets, shoes, and food. That's when Operation Blessing director Diego Traverso met Nili. We found this family and they lost pretty much everything and they don't have insurance. So we're here uh, assisting them. We brought uh, mattresses, some furniture. We brought kitchen supplies, everything that they need now while they're renting a new place. And it is very, very exciting. It's not small because for us it's very big that you know that they're thinking about you, wants to help you. And uh, for us it's a lot. Big, big thank you for all the people who gives. I know one day I want to give to you the same things to another people. God sent you to me. Well, that's just one example of what CBN Israel is doing to help many people here. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and be sure to share us on your social networks. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.